Good evening. Welcome, everybody. My name is David Trulio, and it's my privilege to serve as the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Now, we start all of our official programming here with the Pledge of Allegiance, so I ask that you please stand and join me in honoring the flag and all those who serve under it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we go further, there are a few people in the audience I'd like to recognize. First, it's our special guest's husband, Charles Capito. Please stand, Charles. We, we also have former Congressman Elton Gallagher and his wife, Jan Aunt Janice. And, and we're fortunate this evening to have Reagan Foundation and Institute uh, trustee, former ambassador, Bob Tuttle. Bob. We named this speaker series A Time for Choosing after the October 1964 speech on behalf of presidential candidate Barry Goldwater that catapulted Ronald Reagan into political stardom. For the last two years, we here at the Reagan Foundation and Institute have invited prominent national leaders and thinkers to answer critical questions facing the conservative movement and the Republican Party because they're facing their own time for choosing. They're facing questions such as, with huge challenges for the country ahead of us, with the midterms behind us and a presidential race underway, where will the focus be? What foreign and domestic policy positions are critical to take into the years ahead? And more fundamentally, what are Republican philosophies that all can agree upon? Our special guest this evening brings an enormous wealth of experience in addressing exactly these kinds of questions. In the early days of her career, she served students working as a college counselor and advisor at what is now West Virginia University. She also served as director of the Educational Information Center for the West Virginia Board of Regents, helping to advise higher education policy for her state. While raising three children, she became more involved in her local community, representing her county in the West Virginia House of Delegates. In 2000, she was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, where she worked to expand transportation infrastructure and foster economic growth by supporting community banks. After seven terms representing her constituents in the House, she ran for the United States Senate and was elected with the largest margin of victory for a Republican in state history, winning, get this, more than 70% of the vote and winning in all 55 counties in the state. That's amazing. And if that wasn't enough, in so doing, she also became the first female senator in West Virginia history. She's not only in the Senate, but also a member of the Republican leadership, serving as vice chair of the Senate Republican Conference. In addition, she delivers results through her committee assignments, which include, but are not limited to, serving as the ranking member on the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works, and as the top Republican on the Appropriations Committee's Subcommittee on Labor, Health, and Human Services, Education, and Related Agencies. One of her current priorities is reforming the federal permitting environmental review system, which she described as, quote, a sea of always changing requirements which create hurdle after hurdle for all kinds of projects and a game of regulatory whack-a-mole. To address this, she introduced legislation aimed at streamlining the permitting process and putting in place enforceable timelines on project reviews with the aim of making it easier to build projects produce energy, lower energy costs, and create jobs. In his farewell address, President Reagan reflected on the success his administration achieved. He noted, we weren't just making time, or marking time, we weren't just marking time, we made a difference. Well, our special guest this evening isn't just marking time, she is making a difference. 
And we are excited to welcome her here to the Reagan Library to hear her vision for the conservative movement and the GOP in this modern day time for choosing. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Senate Republican Conference Vice Chair, Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia. Well, David, thank you. Thank you so very much for that very kind introduction, and it's wonderful to see everybody here this evening. Uh, I want to say it's such an honor and really a privilege for me to be here at the Reagan Library. And thank you to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute for not only inviting me to participate, and Charlie, um, but also for giving this a chance for this speaker's series but also for the, all the hard work that you've put in, not just for the, this event, but other events that you hold. So, good evening. I am Shelley Moore Capito, the Senator from West Virginia. You know, it's a real honor to be the first woman ever elected to serve my state of West Virginia in the United States Senate. I'll tell you a little bit of history. There have been over 2,000 men. I'm the 45th woman ever elected in the entire country. Uh, to the United States Senate, which is kind of hard to believe, but it's true. It's an honor for me because I love my country, I love my state, and I love the opportunity to serve the greatest people in the world. I will say it is a burden, though, sometimes, because believe it or not, I am tasked with anchoring the Congressional Women's Softball Team as their oldest member. Basically, I'm the only one that can throw it from third base to first. <laughs> and all joking aside, it is interesting, it's for a good cause, but we play together, Republicans and Democrats, against one of our constant challenges, the press. <laughs> I am very, very honored to participate in this Time for Choosing Speakers series. The invitation suggested speakers will include leading intellectuals, U.S. representatives, U.S. senators, governors, and emerging 2024 presidential candidates. I am so proud to represent the intellectuals in the group. <laughs> I would add uh, that I did attend uh, Duke University and I was a zoology major. Many people ask me, what does having a major in zoology, how does that help you in your political career? And I say, well, I serve in the biggest zoo in America. It's prepared me very, very well. And before you ask, no, I am not running for president. These days, I know it's rare to hear a US senator say that. And actually, one of my fellow senators announced his candidacy just today, Senator Tim Scott, one of your former speakers. So speaking of rumored senators running for president, I also happen to serve with Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia. Now, Joe and I have worked well together for years, and he's been a good friend and colleague. I've likened our relationship to a brother and a sister, because sometimes I want him by my side, and sometimes I want to wring his neck. <laughs> sometimes when he's out on a limb, I want to sit at the bottom of the tree and applaud him for having the nerve to do it, and sometimes I want to saw that limb off. So on a more serious note from this podium, you have heard from some spectacular luminaries that represent the depth and breadth of the conservative movement and what we consider our bench as Republicans. As President Reagan said in 1967, there is room in our tent for many views. Indeed, the divergence of views is one that is our strengths. People like Speaker Paul Ryan, Senators Tom Cotton, Tim Scott and Joni Ernst, all four of those I've had the opportunity to serve with. They make me proud to be an American and proud to be a Republican. It's also great to be here at the Reagan Library here in beautiful Simi Valley, California. I'd note that things have changed in this state under the leadership of Gavin Newsom. <laughs> if you're flying in from red states, like I did, um, they make you go through customs. They patted me down for plastic water bottles and pocket constitutions. I guess they didn't want anybody getting any ideas. 
So one of the many reasons I'm grateful to be a part of this series is that my ties to President Reagan go back to my childhood. My father, Arch Moore, served as governor from West Virginia the same time as Ronald Reagan served as governor of California. Not to make things awkward, but my father was actually a Gerald Ford supporter in 1976. So when I was looking around, you know how you, my parents died and uh, my father died in 2015, the day after I was sworn in as a senator, and I was looking around just as I was getting ready to pack up to come here, and I ran into this. This is my dad's badge from the 1976 convention. It, it lists, it has his picture, it has him listed President Ford Convention Staff, it has his name, but if you look closely, it has his social security number on the front. <laughs> what in the heck? Anyway, but one of the many, many things that endeared my family to President Reagan, even after that, was he invited my dad to serve on his campaign committee in 1979. There were no grudges, no animosity, and they worked together quite successfully for the good of the cause. And boy, did they do a lot of good. They worked together so well that if you look at the September 7th, 1983 entry in the Reagan Diaries, you'll see the president met with my dad to encourage him to get into the West Virginia Senate race. He said he wanted my dad to move back to Washington to renew the warm friendship that they had when my dad worked with him on the campaign and lived in Washington as a member of the House. You know, I remember that. Every time I look at that box of jelly beans with the White House seal that he brought back, I kept everything, kept, brought back from that visit. I still keep it in my office today where I hold that very same Senate seat that President Reagan encouraged my father to run for. But the highlight for me was when my mother met Nancy. She was a vision, beautiful, regal, graceful. And I think she was just likely being kind when she turned to my mother and said, how are your children so normal? This is a true story, by the way. My mother responded without skipping a beat and said, well, it's a lot easier when they aren't raised in Hollywood. <laughs> my mother was proud of our roots, and so am I. My mother uh, was originally from Georgia. Her parents, her family were Southern Baptists, and many at the time, they were classic Southern Democrats. She and my dad met at West Virginia University. And when she told her mother they were going to get married, you would have thought the world was ending. Her mother said to her, we're from the South and you're marrying a Northerner. We're Baptists and you're marrying a Methodist. We're Democrats and you're marrying a Republican? What are you going to do next? Sell your soul to the devil. Um, so you can see where I get my theatrical side from. <laughs> my mother became a West Virginian through and through and was the longest serving first lady in our state's history. And she was not a passive first lady by any means. She traveled the state and the country to tell our great West Virginia story and carry the proud flag of Appalachia to the rest of the world. She was well ahead of her time, recognizing the need for open conversations and dialogue around mental health. So I stand before you as a proud child of Appalachia, something that might make me a little different from most of your previous speakers, because our state of West Virginia is the only state contained fully within Appalachia. Hard work, self-sufficiency, and national pride are all deeply instilled in our DNA. And as a region, we have one of the highest percentage of veterans per capita. I've often compared West Virginia to one large, small town where we know how to stand up for ourselves while we're still looking out for one another. We're tough as nails, but we always have a smile on our face. John F. Kennedy said about our state, the sun doesn't always shine on West Virginia, but the people do. So the themes of this speaker series are three key questions. Why are you a Republican? What, what should the Republican Party stand for? And what are the Republican philosophies that we can all agree on? For me, West Virginia is at the core of all of these questions. West Virginia's political history isn't that much different than President Reagan's. For many, many decades, we were a deep blue state. 
Herbert Hoover in 1928 was the last non-incumbent Republican presidential candidate to win our electoral votes before the year 2000. In the 70s and 80s, we voted for Jimmy Carter twice. We even voted for Michael Dukakis. <laughs> in the 80s and 90s, we were almost exclusively represented by Democrats in both the House and the Senate. We were influenced and animated by our proud labor unions and our state was a powerful hub for blue collar Democrats. But as you know, West Virginia eventually demonstrated what Ronald Reagan said. We didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left us. The year 2000 was when the tide really turned. And that was with the candidate, candidacy of one Albert Arnold Gore Jr. Al Gore focused on a couple key issues that rubbed our state wrong. Those issues were Second Amendment constitutional rights and the elimination of fossil fuels. Very few things about his campaign worked for the state, and he seemed to know it, because in late October of 2000, he finally showed up at the West Virginia Capitol steps with celebrity secret weapons. But George W. Bush, at Karl Rove's insistence, had already visited several times in our state, and for Mr. Gore, it was simply too little, too late. While Florida and their hanging chads stole the show, West Virginia shocked the political world by delivering five critical electoral votes for George W. Bush after we had voted for uh, Bill Clinton twice in a row. Without our votes, the United States would have had at least four years of Al Gore, and I think we can all imagine how different our country would look today. Then, eight years later, an idealistic President Barack Obama came along and poured gasoline on the fire of West Virginia's divorce from the Democratic Party. In 2008, he famously said, if, someone wants to build, if somebody wants to build a coal-fired power plant, they can, it will just bankrupt them. That wasn't a warning, it was a threat, and he made good on it. His recklessness cost tens of thousands of coal miners and related workers their jobs during his presidency. That's tens of thousands of families who lost their livelihoods and the dignity of work that had been such a foundational part of their Appalachian identity. The disintegration of the Democrat Party and, cons and consequent rise of the West Virginia GOP didn't end with President Obama. The left has only grow, grown bolder in their crusade, one that prioritizes academic goals and partisan ideology over the well-being of everyday Americans. They're coming for your gas stoves, your washing machines, your dishwasher, and even your refrigerator. The efficiency rules extend all the way to microwaves, and I didn't know this one, toothbrush chargers. Manufacturers have already warned that appliances that meet these outrageous new standards are not only expensive, much more expensive, but they're less effective. Under that vision of America, those who have worked hard, saved, paid debts, and responsibly managed their credit are penalized to support those who have not. But you know what? Fairness is what most Americans understand and what the country was built on. So take the student loan bailout, an overreaching policy proposal that just two or three years ago was Twitter fodder for the left-wing uh, left Twitter, Twitters, but has now made it into executive actions by the President of the United States. The cost of that debt transfer is passed on to other taxpayers, many of whom who make significantly less money than the graduate degree holder whose debt they're being asked to pay off. Many families are now being forced to pay, many, many families now being forced to pay have sacrificed and worked hard to pay off their own student debts and even made academic choices to avoid taking on debt altogether. We know this plan, if the courts allow it to go into effect, will raise taxes and increase the cost of higher education. It's just not well thought out. And beyond all of that, it's fundamentally unfair.
So when it comes to taxes and spending, this president might have won the battle in the Democrat primary in 2020, but a cursory glance at the policies and personnel show that Bernie Sanders actually won that war. Their spending makes drunken sailors look like teetotalers. That spending has come with consequences, and Americans have spent much of President Biden's first term suffering through the worst inflation in 40 years. Support for spending cuts is at an all-time high, as the American people have made that connection that government spending is raising the prices of the goods they need to survive. But on the subject of why am I Republican, I'll note at the outset, at the outset that I, I already mentioned, it's not simply because I fundamentally disagree with that vision for America. There's certain, that's certainly a contributing factor, but there's so much more. I grew up watching my parents work as public servants. My dad, as I touched on earlier, was a Republican through and through and served our state of West Virginia at both the state and federal level. So my exposure to this as a young girl not only shaped many of my values today, but it also inspired me to serve and make a difference. But most importantly, I'm a Republican because I believe our party can provide a better way because we have done it before. We believe in fair elections, in a secure border, and in a strong national defense. And we believe that strong families are at the core of a functioning society. They always have been, and they always must be. We believe in limited government. And now more than ever, we believe in a government that stays in its lane and protecting and preserving the institutions that keep America strong. One of the best ways to do that is to help those institutions stay focused on their core mission. We believe in respecting the judicial branch, even as the left attempts to tear it down for not advancing their preferred policy outcomes. The then minority leader Chuck Schumer stood the day that he stood on the Supreme Court steps and threatened justices by name, saying to justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, Quote, you have released the whirlwind, and you will pay the price, and you won't know what hit you. That was a dark day for our system of government. The personal destruction of Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett were some of the most disturbing episodes of my public service. As Republicans, we realize, as the founders did, that the role of the judge is to interpret the law, not make law. And we condemn the extremists who have tried to threaten our jurists and their families over decisions they do not like. We believe that teachers should focus on teaching. As the world moves ahead of us in math and basic literacy, too many of our taxpayer-funded public school teachers are substituting key teaching time with divisive and often controversial issues that really don't have a place in the classroom. You know. Parents matter. And if you don't believe me, just ask your former speaker, Governor Yunkin. We believe in an intelligence committee, community that focuses on protecting the homeland, not one political party over another. We believe in law enforcement and giving them the resources they need to keep our cities and neighbors, neighborhoods safe. We believe in supporting our military as they strive to protect us as well as their families and the veterans who have bravely served before them. We believe in responsible regulation, not the weaponization of regulation for political purposes or regulation for regulation's sake, or what we've seen recently, regulation to, to satisfy an agenda, but with these required standards that really no one can meet. Anyone who has ever tried to build anything knows that we have a permitting system that feels like it was built to break your spirits before you even hammered your first nail. It hurts our economy. It hurts jobs. And we can and will do better. Thank you. We believe in an American system of free enterprise, where businesses rise and succeed on merit and the quality of their products not because of their politics 
or their ESG scores. Scoring systems that force companies and governments to prioritize political benchmarks over delivering returns on investment and pensions run in direct opposition to the free market system our founders intended, which has built the greatest economic system in the history of civilization. That's not to say there isn't room for valuable discussion about innovation in renewable energy and other eff efforts to help preserve the environment that we love. The environment is not a bad word as much as the left has weaponized their efforts to defend it. Take one step out into the great outdoors out here or to the great outdoors of West Virginia and you'll understand why I believe with my whole heart why we call our state almost heaven and why I believe both our environment and our planet are worth protecting. We believe in a secure border. Immigration has been critical to the building of America that we have, the America we have today. We are absolutely a nation of immigrants and we always will be. But the biggest threat to that system comes from a lack of order like the kind we've seen over the last few years. I'll say it again, the greatest threat to our legal immigration system is unchecked illegal immigration. Not only because of the dangers that come from cartels and violent criminals, but also the scourge of fentanyl, which we see and know too much about in our state of West Virginia. One of the greatest honors I've had as a U.S. Senator is attending naturalization ceremonies and seeing new Americans who had come from different countries who had worked long and hard to earn it, to take their oath of citizenship. The pride they showed in becoming Americans was inspiring, pure, and beautiful. And while I'm proud to be a Republican, I believe there are things we can do better. Earlier in my remarks, I noted a number of ways I believe the Democrats have moved to the far left and abandoned a large swath of Americans. And if we can't win people over after an administration has raised your taxes, taken away your stoves, raised gas and electric bills, handed Afghanistan to the Taliban, fought to destroy women's sports, injected politics into everything from political education to where you keep your savings account, and has the lowest approval rating at this point in any presidency, then what are we even doing here? The only thing from keeping us from the creating the greatest coalition in history is our own self-defeating behavior. Here are five areas where I think we, we can and must improve to succeed. First, we must get back to focusing on wins and points on the board. There are no moral victories in politics, and far too often we pri prioritize bluster that makes us feel good over substance that can make a difference for the people that we serve. <laughs> Speaker Boehner repeatedly said, Elton, you'll remember this, good policy makes good politics. That means looking past the loudest voices to the smartest voices and actually listening to what they have to say. People really want to talk about the future. They want to talk about their children's future. That's what they really care about. So Michael Jordan once said, some people want it to happen. Some people wish it would happen. Others make it happen. Well, the political version of that is, some people tweet about it. Some people go on TV to talk about it. Others roll up their sleeves and do the work to make it happen. Grievance may sell well on social media and cable TV, but it's not accomplishing anything for the people who need it. The great West Virginia native Lou Holtz once said, never tell your problems to anyone. 80% don't care, and the other 20% are glad that you have them. <laughs> As Leader McConnell is fond of saying, winners make policy, Losers go home. Second, purity tests are the fastest way to ensure we divide ourselves and seize defeat from the jaws of victory. As President Reagan said, 
The person who agrees with you 80% of the time is a friend and ally, not a 20% traitor. In every fight, we should push for the most conservative victory possible. But we should not leave the field if we don't get 100% of what we want. We need to make the case that our policies and our ideas with facts and compassion, recognizing that just as our party is a big tent, our country is an even bigger tent. And there's so much more that unites us than divides us. In our diverse Senate caucus, we don't agree on everything, no shock there, but the greatest victories con Congress has seen in recent years came when we found the best, most conservative solution possible and taken the win. Making perfect the enemy of the good is a very efficient way to preserve a bad status quo. So let the other side have their litmus tests. I'd rather have the wins. Third. So often our biggest challenges come from our inability to effectively convey our values and our beliefs. While it's important to speak to those who are already on our side, when we only speak to our side, we find that we get a little rusty when we try and reach out to the others. In 2004, I formed the House Civility Caucus at the request of your own California representative, former representative David Dreyer. I asked my friend, uh, Representative Emanuel Cleaver, a Democrat from Missouri, and we formed the Civility Caucus and we had civil debates on the floor, Republican Democrat ideas on really tough issues. Well, we had a merry little band, but I'll add that while I could get 23 people to join the Civility Caucus, I was reminded that the Wine Caucus had 126. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. But to me, civility is critical to our communication. Moving past the slash and burn of our current politics will be essential to expanding our party. To quote the great Lou Holtz again, if you burn your neighbor's house down, it doesn't make your house look any better. My fourth point is expanding our reach is the need for authenticity. The American people appreciate authenticity and we should give them the benefit of the doubt that they will reward us for honesty and vulnerability. We live in difficult times for everyone. President Reagan wasn't just a, the great communicator because he had punchy one-liners and clever zingers. He was authentic and real, and he was open with the American people. Nowhere was this more evident than when he opened up to the world about his Alzheimer's diagnosis in his final letter to the American people. As a child, me, a child of two parents who battled Alzheimer's, his letter about it touched me deeply for its humility, his authenticity, and his vulnerability. He wrote in part, and I quote, so now we feel it is important to share it with you. In opening our hearts, we hope this might provoke, promote greater awareness of this condition. Perhaps it will encourage a clearer understanding of the individuals and families affected by it. He went on to say, unfortunately, as Alzheimer's disease progresses, the family often bears a heavy burden. I only wish there was some way I could spare Nancy from this painful experience. When the time comes, I am confident that with your help, she will face it with faith and courage. And then he closed. I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. I know that for America, there will always be a bright dawn ahead. So what his words mean to me are a compassionate understanding of how each and every American has certain sorrows and joys and challenges. And a compassionate understanding will make us as a party uh, be the party of a united nation, not the fractured nation that we have become. My fifth and final suggestion for our Republican Party is that we need to start listening more to America's younger generation. While the left is thought to lure them in by dangling incentives like student debt bailouts and electric vehicle tax credits, we've seen Gen Z and millennial voters sour due to inflation, increased costs, and really unrealistic aspirations. In addition to winning more of them over with a better performing economy, 
We will win more of them over with better candidates focused on helping people and by engaging in the conversations that we as a party have often avoided, like the need to protect our environment, like the need to improve childcare, or raise awareness about and treat mental health challenges. These are systemic issues, among others, that the young, people's, young people really care about. As we protect and restore credit in our American institutions, I believe we'll see a great restoration of pride in America and in our American values. And the institution I believe is most important to this great restoration is the American family. President Reagan once said, all change in America begins at the dinner table. In his farewell address, he spoke of the need for an informed patriotism to ensure we are teaching our children what America is and what she represents in the long history of the world. He spoke of the importance of starting with the basics, more attention to American history, and a greater emphasis on civic ritual. And again, as President Reagan said, this can and should begin at the dinner table. Restoring the institution of the family has become a critical national component, which ensuring our policies reflect that parents should have the final say over the well-being of their children, and that families are empowered as much as possible to manage stable homes in safe communities. So I want to close by telling you why I maintain hope for both our party and our country. I started out talking about the other great Republicans who have shared this podium. They come from different backgrounds, different experiences, and together they paint a bright picture of a bright future for our party and in turn, our country. In America, the states are still the laboratories of democracy and every day leaders in states particularly conservative states, are putting our ideas to the test and proving that limited government, free enterprise, low regulation, and our model of freedom are the keys to prosperity and happiness. And I believe my state of West Virginia is leading the way now. We have challenges, but boy do we have challenges. But as a party, we're better equipped to meet them than at any point in our amazing history. Throughout American history, we have preserved our culture by ensuring that the next generation knew about the heroes that came before. I mean, that's what this museum's about. In DC, we have great monuments to Washington, Lincoln, and Jefferson. And this incredible library, as I said, is a monument to one of the greatest Americans of the 20th century. And we have many more heroes to come whose stories will be written based on the way in which they faced their current challenges. So let that be our part of informed patriotism going into the future. My own service is entwined with those that have gone before me. As a nine-year-old, my dad took me to the United States Capitol and I stood on a windowsill where I watched our nation grieve for President Kennedy. And now, 60 years later, when I walk those halls, I can feel by the grooves in the marble steps the spirits of the men and women who have risen to the challenges of their generation. The honor bestowed on me is never lost. I'm humbled, proud, and grateful to walk in their shadows. President Reagan closed his timeless Time for Choosing speech with the incredible invitation. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny will preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth. We stand on a similar principus today, and we have the tools to climb on as the great city on a hill that's inspired millions to embark through darkness and danger for the mere chance to stand on our shores. The roadmap, the roadmap is simple, you might think. Choose substance. Demand the best of those who represent you and fight like hell for the things you believe in, and we will come out on top. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated as our special guest leaves the building.
Russian man claiming to hold top-level secrets about Russian advanced bombers has just turned up at the U.S. southern border, seeking asylum. The man claims to have been an engineer at a production facility over in the city of Kazan, and he says that he possesses top-secret information about the White Swan Tu-160, which is the most advanced bomber in the Russian arsenal. U.S. border officials, they interviewed the man, and they determined that his story was in fact credible and eventually passed him off to the FBI, who are still in the process of interrogating him right now. However, analysts have pointed out that the fact that the story was even leaked to the public is an indication that perhaps the American government is encouraging other Russians who also hold top-level secrets to also escape to America. And if you thought that was interesting, well then you should click on that button below this video and check out Epic TV, one of the best no censorship video platforms on the internet.